Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone from Casablanca, Morocco. My name is Huda Abari, and I am the founder and executive director of Transformative Peace. I want to welcome you all to our special panel on religion and peace building. This is our fourth transformative conversation in which we hope will inspire action, foster a community of practice and dialogue, and most importantly, cuts across borders. Our work in transformative peace has shown us firsthand the vital role of religion in peace building. We can see this play out in Afghanistan, for example. For instance, women's rights were used as a bargaining tool and a negotiating tool by both internal and external factors. The framing of women's rights is constrained by the Taliban's use of religiously grounded arguments and the West partial justification for the occupation as liberating Afghan women from oppression and their burqa. So with such mistrust and aversion to West-driven programming, even well-intentioned human rights norms, or even the Afghan constitution can be labeled as foreign. Afghan women's rights organizations found that cases basically based solely on Afghan's constitution relating to inheritance, for instance, uh, maintenance, divorce, or separation were actually rejected by the public. And formal laws explained from an Islamic legal perspective were far more acceptable. Organizations that engage with faith-based leaders and were exposed to other Islamic experiences were much more willing to change their stance and their perceptions on what is the role of women in Islamic communities. So with Islamic law having more credibility among the community and with greater opportunity for progressive interpretation, adopting Islamic legal framework to promote women's rights and respond to the customary laws that have been discriminatory towards women has shown to be absolutely critical. And this is just one small example of the role of religion in peace building. So in this light, we are incredibly fortunate to have with us two distinguished and dear panelists, Reverend Dr. Fatima Saleh and Ms. Manal Omar, whose work is firmly rooted in the principles of social and racial justice from a very faith-based approach. So welcome to you both. I would Thank first you. like, absolutely, I would first I'd like to introduce Manal Omar. She is the founder and CEO of Across Red Lines, a pioneering organization that focuses on a holistic approach to building inclusive and diverse societies through its investment in women leaders. Manal uses her 20 plus years of global experience to advocate for women's rights through a faith-based approach. Previously, she was the Associate Vice President for Middle East and Africa Center at the United States Institute of Peace. Manel was named among the top 500 world's most influential Arabs by Arabia Business Power in 2011 and 2012, and also recognized among the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by Georgetown University and the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center in 2009, mashallah. Um, she holds a master's degree in Arab studies from Georgetown University and a bachelor's degree in international uh, relations from George Mason University. The next person I want to introduce is Dr. Fatima Saleh. She is a reverend social justice advocate and an educator. Dr. Saleh received her PhD in mass communication from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Go Tar Heels. <laughs> she also earned a master's degree from Syracuse University in public communication and a second master's in divinity from Duke University. She is married to Eric Sorensen and they have four beautiful children. She is currently the founder of A Certain Work, an organization dedicated to educating on the intersection of issues in faith, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm really, really excited having you both, especially like two powerful women faith-based leaders talking about religion and peace building, which is mostly dominated um, by men in these, uh, in these types of spaces. So let's begin. We sometimes hear policymakers and analysts speak of either holy wars, where you hear the word jihad, religious conflicts, in a way that implies as if economics, politics, or even resources couldn't play a determining factor because religion is the main and most important factor. 
Additionally, rhetoric linking religion to violence has sometimes also, we have seen it being used as a way to target particular religions or justify racism and discrimination. And we actually currently see this right now um, in the media framing of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. So starting at the very basic, this is a question to you both. What stereotypes or popular misconceptions about the role of religion in global conflict should be dispelled up front? Hmm. Powerful. <laughs> I guess I'll jump right in then. <laughs> um, it's such a poignant question. Um, it, I think one of the things that I would I would jump in and say um, something that Pope Francis already said, which is as dangerous as religious extremism is religious reductionism. Mm -hmm. And I think that I get worried, particularly within the United States, because we tend to have an all or nothing approach. Um, and, you know, however you want to look at religion, religion holds incredible moral authority in different sectors and particularly on the ground and kind of the example you gave with Afghanistan, that's why it works is who holds moral authority. Um, and I was just speaking with the fellow panelists before, like I grew up on the Bible Belt. So as much as you want to say America's secular, um, it's hard to eliminate religion. And when we take it from the public square, when we reduce the conversation of religion, and particularly we tend to reduce it to fighting extremism, then we leave that field and that sector to be defined by the fight of extremism. And we forget all the original part of religion. Um, and I think it was um, Dr. Uh, Aiza Karam from UNFPA who mm. first said, um, that religion, you know, it is the first responders, whether it was the church, the mosque, the temple, the synagogue, like that was the initial first responder. Um, I think we need to be careful not to wear rose colored glasses because mm -hmm. a lot of humanitarian was missionaries and I think there's a legitimate allergy towards religion. So we need to find that balance. Um, but at the same time, again, once we reduce it, then we tend to leave it for the extremists to define. I think part of the rose colored glasses and you mentioned about women, um, you know, and I think this is why women in faith circles can be so powerful is we do fall in between the cracks. You know, we're not acknowledged by secular women's movement. And if we are, it can be a little condescending. Um, and then clearly most religious institutions are very patriarchal. So we tend to fall in between the cracks, but I would argue that makes us the natural peace builders, the natural bridge builders, because we're not naive about either world. We see the challenges in both worlds and we can help build those bridges. Um, so that would be kind of my first quick response to such a deep and full question that I could probably go on for hours about. Thanks, Menel. Thanks, very powerful, absolutely. Dr. Fatima? So I, you know, whenever I start speaking, I always, I always like to say what my social location is. I'm a black Puerto Rican Malaysian woman um, who's privileged in certain aspects, I'm cishet you know, I'm cisgendered, heterosexual. So I'm moving in the in a realm um, and educated in America. So, and a Christian, right? And being taught in the Christian, the Christian vernacular around spirituality. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I do that from a, a black woman lens. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanna say that, I always say that whenever I, I speak, I mm -hmm. have to kind of acknowledge the fact of where my body sits in the work. And then how that has shaped even my vision of God, religion, and spirituality. Now, when it comes to how this religion is both weaponized and also moves in that the fact that it has been a culprit, a co-conspirator in, in certain ways, and then in, and at the same site, a liberator. So I cannot yeah. speak outside of the Black American experience, which at, there's, a, there's a Christianity coming up and fully rubber stamping and, and um, a, a, a God that says that you, you should have slaves and slaves obey your masters. At the same time, our, lig our religion is evoking and coming up out of the backwoods brush robbers of the plantation that says we deserve to be free. And so hmm. if you think of that dynamic existing on the same ground in the same place, you can see how laws and government would be able to support, hey, we need to have slaves and then how liberation is also moved through a religious standpoint at the same site, supposedly believing in the same God. I don't know if that's true. Um, mm. And so I'm going to, I'm going to trouble that water. Cause I don't think necessarily slave masters and were actually, or when 
the constitution or whatever was written and we're, we're and we're well to talk about god and have god on money but heaven forbid we start using it and moving it in ways that are liberative and set people free um mm -hmm. so and and we talk about how white supremacy has a way of using god in ways that they need to politically but heaven forbid that that same way be used to challenge the political the political landscape in forms of how god can be a liberator so and I think that's existed for a very long time, especially on this ground and in the world. And if I take it and move it in world religion or even in a world landscape, um, especially in, in regards to Christianity, um, this has always been the tension. Like what's going on? Like how can you say you believe in a peace loving God and then have policy that dehumanizes and is, and is deeply violent? So I, I, I want to name that. I want to name that. For my own ties, I'm like religion. Good gracious, I don't. You know, when people come to me, and it's sometimes when you're, when you're clergy, people are like religion is horrible. This is a hard. I'm like, you know what I say. And then Christianity, what is it done? And you know what I say. You're right. Mm -hmm. what, what would you like me to defend? <laughs> <laughs> Thank Arbo. you. Thank you. I mean, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatima. This is very deep, and this is what this conversation is supposed to be about. You know trying to uncover and, 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 and really dismantle these issues that are black or white and showing the complexities of it. And also showing that it's not, you know, it's not, we don't have an easy answer. And we have to see where we are positioned within these privileges that we enjoy as well to be able to really respond to these questions. Um, and putting liberation at the forefront, which is absolutely powerful and important and much needed to showcase how religion has been used either as a positive force or a negative force that you both mentioned, which takes me a little bit to more on um, freedom of religion or belief and the role of government specifically. Uh, Pew reported that in 2018, that the global median level of government restrictions on religion had reached an all-time high. The highest yearly increase was in, in freedom of religion or belief was seen in Asia Pacific region where we saw large scale persecution, forced uh, displacement of the Rohingya Muslims in Burma, the detention of over a thousand Muslim religious prisoners in Uzbekistan and widespread crackdown of various religious activities in China and elsewhere in the region, not just Muslims. So while social hostilities against religious groups remain a problem, uh, the majority of religious groups are more likely to experience discrimination or violence as a result of government restrictions. We can see this even now in France, for instance, where, you know, with, uh, you know, la laïcité, the government led laïcité and what it means and how it imposes when you say the white supremacy and the role of white supremacy um, within our understanding of religion and the role of power as well. So with this in mind, what do you see as being the relationship between government limitations on freedom of religion or belief and social hostilities towards religious groups? Or how do these both of these factors interact to contribute to escalated instances of religiously driven violent conflict? <laughs> Anna, do you want to? I always get teary when I hear these kind of things. I'm just, I'm a mess. So just forgive me I, if I cry. Oh, no, no. I'm just like. You, no, you get your human moment. Of no. Course. I think. It's interesting that government restrictions on other religions are usually based in a religious ideology. So they're almost buffering it. It's not, it's not a religious. And I think that's the thing that these these restrictions are not a religious. They're actually restrictions placed on other religions, not the ones that they're holding to. And I want to name that because people always say, and especially in a certain strand of theology called womanism, they're like the personal is political. Um, and I don't want to forget that. Um, but the fact that religion can be rooted to move in government against other beliefs in God and in deity and in ways of being 
is probably one of the greatest spiritual abuses there are. Mm -hmm. um, and I would dare say it goes definitely counter to the Christian God and of peace. And let me just say this, having lovely and amazing relatives in Malaysia, all of which were Muslim, um, hence uh, my last name, my name, that their belief in God is deeply rooted in a peace as well and in an acceptance. And so I, I don't understand how we get to the point that our belief systems, which are deeply rooted in a peace and an acceptance and a love, let's, let's start there with the L word, can move and, and be grounded in a religion to be so harmful to another. <laughs> and, and the dehumanization of that is deeply troubling. I just don't, I, I think my, my one son told me, he goes, I think God gets a bad rap. <laughs> and I've been thinking about that, like, and I'm like, yeah, who is God's PR team? They're horrible. Like, it's just like, who says this is what needs to happen? And um, I'm, I'm deeply troubled that religious freedom, as it goes down, I, perhaps in my deepest of hearts, I believe that it is the ability for all of us to have our truths and to stand equally beside ourselves, each other in those truths. And then we don't get to go around in the world and weaponize what we hold as a spiritual truth against another. And, and, that, and that when you say in medicine, first do no harm, mm -hmm. I, I wonder how religion and spirituality have not taken that same stance in some ways. And so I'm deeply troubled by how much religious freedom has been stripped away and how much violence comes in the way because it's not a vacuum it doesn't leave a hole in <laughs> fact it hasn't it hasn't a repercussion of which deep violence usually follows intolerance mm -hmm. thank you thank you uh, i think one of the key words is also the uh, that you mentioned that stuck with me is the the dehumanization and once you dehumanize it's so easy to do anything else it becomes easy to kill um to, to not see the other as worthy of having even a life. Uh, Menel, do you want to add something to this to this question? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually a question I spent a lot a lot of time thinking about, and I would say something that brought me to both faith and women, because um, having worked on the front lines of so many conflicts, uh, it, it, you know, there was inevitably the question, why are we not preventing this? I think that's one of the worst parts of my career was seeing mm -hmm. almost every atrocity was so preventable. In fact, we were flagging and ringing bells and being ignored. Um, and so I would step back and really ask myself, like, why is it being prevented? And I want to go um, kind of to that point of, you know, the personal is political and taking it one step further and saying it's by design. Mm -hmm. You know, when Karl Marx said that religion is the opium of the masses, mm -hmm. there was an acknowledgement that the inverse is also true, right? It's also the mm -hmm. great mobilizer. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in a conflict zone, you can't really say, okay, I want that piece of land. I want that well. I want that cattle. I want that oil. But if God tells you to go get it, you have a completely different argument. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen that play out in many, many different ways. And I would say that the tool of freedom of religion is also, unfortunately, something that can be easily weaponized. And, and we've seen that over and over. Um, and I want to make sure we don't take out the design and the political, because if we forget that it's designed this way, yeah. mm -hmm. um, if we forget that there are the powers that be that understand human nature and archetypes, and they've designed the conflicts in such a brilliant way to convince us that peace is not possible right? Mm -hmm. When you're talking about a family feud of the Abrahamic faiths of Israel and Palestine, you're going to, you know, throw up your hands in the air and say, I don't know what to do. Um, whereas the logical response is God is not a real estate agent. He did not come and carve a slice of land and get two Thank populations you. to fight over it. And yes. let's look at the resources that are underneath. Let's look at the real trauma and fear you know, when we look at, you know, uh, like the actual conflicts, and it's a quote that I use from Father Richard Rohr, which is trauma that's not transformed is transferred. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so just like there are equations and ways to design, the peace activists, I would say those who really are rooted in faith and spirit, know the equations to undo as well, if space is created. And that's my way of kind of reinstilling hope, because I've seen it. I've seen some of the worst atrocities in the name. you know, beautiful response of neighbor with neighbor and stuff also in the name of religion. Now, just one thing on the power play, what we have up for grabs and something that I'm very excited about and happy to be back in my adopted homeland of America, because I think it's the most dramatic here, is what's up for grabs is the social contract. Um, The social contract that was based on fear and scarcity, it's falling apart. Our beautiful youth, God bless the new generations who are coming out strong, not Mm -hmm. taking the status quo, you know, things that my generation were outraged by, but worked around. The newer generation is saying, why work around? We're going through and we're dismantling. Um, And with that, I have a cautionary note of, you know, be careful of anarchy. (laughs) You know, as someone who's lived and witnessed it, you don't want that. But disrupting to rebuild is absolutely necessary. And I think that's what's happening is the social contract. And that's where I see religion. If we can negotiate religion within this new social contract, which is based on abundance, which is based on the power of love, it is not a light power. You know, we call this stuff soft power. There is nothing harder than love. You know, that transforms entire societies. It's why my campaign now is called Let Love In is because it's a powerful energy. I would argue it's the highest vibration closest to God energy. And so once we embrace that, we're going to have a new social contract that the powers that be will have to listen to. And again, this isn't a theory. I've seen it happen on the micro community level. Where we fail is taking it to scale. And I think that's where I'm really eager to get in the room and play with other leaders is how do we, we know it works in the small. We know we see it in our communities. We've seen our communities be resilient, you know, survive things that nobody should survive. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we take it to scale? And that's the question that I really face more and more at night. Thank you. Thank you, Manan, for that and for also giving examples to our viewers. Uh, You raised something that actually fits really nicely into what I wanted to ask, um, which is a little bit some of that tension of the role of religion and also secularism in terms of peace building. And so we know that there is a rich history. Of course, we can't say, you know, it's not all roses and religion Mm -hmm. has been instrumentalized and also has been used um, as a negative force. However, there's also a rich history of mediation and conflict uh, resolution efforts that have been led by religious actors that I have seen and witnessed myself in the Middle East and North Africa that have done incredible work with little, little resources because they have the moral authority, the credibility and the trust of their local communities and they're being driven by the cause as well. However, we've also seen that there is a large tension, specifically when I'm trying to um, link the local, very hyper-local to more international community or the development world, where there's silos, where religious religion, the role of religion with peace building in peace building is they're both, they're in silos. So you have like secular and then the religion and it's looked down upon. And it's yeah. kind of like sometimes the quote unquote, the embassy imam, it's like the moderate, which is a word that I hate to use, uh, yeah. only the ones that we see go from one embassy to another embassy, but don't really have much of legitimacy within their local communities. So what is there to be gained by integrating like some of the religious peace building tools or for our viewers that are listening who are coming from the policy world or more from a secular perspective on the role of religion as a positive, playing a positive role in mediation or conflict resolution, which could be from the very, very local in, you know, in North Carolina to very, you know, international uh, in uh, uh, international different uh, contexts. And what would you say are some of the barriers that we have to think about as well when we're thinking about this question? Wow, Huda. I mean, you you warned us that you're not going to throw out any easy questions, but thank you for following through. <laughs> That's another really 
really intense and deep question. I mean, one thing I would say is religion was weaponized, but I would I, I like to say lack of consciousness is what was weaponized, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't want to give power over to those who weaponize and manipulate religion to say they actually got a hold on religion, right? It's mm-hmm. those who have a lack of consciousness. Unfortunately, um, the collective conscious has been hit pretty strongly. Um, I would point out, you know, generally this is this year has actually been a little bit of a fun year to tease my secular friends because they're always like, well, if I don't see it, then it's not a real threat. And until I see it, I don't believe it. And then the whole world shut down to the unseen, which is mm-hmm. what a virus is. Mm-hmm. So I feel like um, with the pandemic, we got to say, yeah, not all big threats can be seen, not all power can be seen. And there is a value in examining the unseen. Um I think it's also, you know, we've had this conversation, Huda, and actually we, we, this will be coming out soon too, on the tension between peace and justice. So I think when people are rejecting that term, it's also understanding that for a lot of oppressed people, they hear peaceful surrender, they don't hear peace. And that's what a lot of, I think, particularly the very local religious leaders tend to be responding to. Um, I remember working in Gombe in Northern Nigeria and being told you can't travel to that area. It's religious extremists, religious extremists. And this was from people in Abuja. So it's not like these were people outside of Nigeria. These were Nigerians telling me, do not go. And it's a very mm-hmm. similar experience in Tunisia, in Tunis, where they were like, don't go to Sijnan, don't go to Sijnan, mm-hmm. it's crazy, it's extremist. And generally, that's how we define religious or impoverished areas as dangerous and crazy. And that's how they become marginalized. So automatically, it's usually the first place I will go. Um, And so both in Sijnan and Gombe, you heard a lot of violent rhetoric, but it was rooted in deep injustices and marginalization. It was not rooted in religion. So I think that's where you have to go. Um, I have three areas in terms of engaging religious leaders. One is truly respecting their viewpoint. We tend, like you said, the embassy imams, like we tend to choose flavors of the month. Um, Even if they're legitimate, I call it hugging them to death. Like we'll find someone who's legitimate. We give them a courageous award. And next thing we know, they're being shot or they're no longer legitimate. So like the international community has a horrible way of hugging legitimate voices to, to death or creating brand new voices that have no uh, moral authority, which would be my second rule is authenticity. You've got to protect their authenticity, which means that they are usually going to be critical. And I've seen over and over where they're not invited to the table, where they're seen as, you know, aggressive, disruptive, all these were, I've been labeled that way over and over. I cannot tell you how many times people will try to teach me how to speak. And, you know, do not interrupt, do not interrupt. Well, you're giving me a 10 minute monologue that's wasting my time, that's irrelevant. I will interrupt and bring you back on track, you know? So I think that there's just different ways of dismissing authentic voices. But the third element is always remembering religious law is not above national law. Because I think that's the biggest fear is that you start to over empower religion and then you bring in the question of the rule of law. And I think from the very beginning when I'm working in religious spaces, I have a shared understanding and it goes back to social contract. Religion is part of social contract, but social contract is ruled by an agreed upon and built for the entire population rule of law program, which until today, we really don't have institutions that reflect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manel. Uh, Very pertinent, especially those three main takeaways. Thanks. Dr. Fatima, as a faith-based leader as well, so oh, I think, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your comment, I, I, your, your response. I was taking notes. I take notes doing anything so I can remember um, and also sure. hold, hold it. Um, but just those three points were beautiful. I, um, I think you've caught me at an awkward time in my own faith journey. I'm not, I'm not big on religious leaders right now. Um, and that's okay. <laughs> And uh, that's okay. I, I, I've been disappointed. I, 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 I want to maybe I want to reconsider. <laughs> and that sounds I know that sounds it's okay. Crazy. I've been believe me, I've been disappointed by many, so it's yeah, okay. So I'm just like, oh, do I've we really want? Yeah, I'm like, do you really want to kind of you know? And so I'm yeah. gonna hold that intention that I'm at a space in my own life that I don't know if I want to put that much in the hands of religious leaders. Um, 
First of all, I think ordination and who gets to be religious leaders is deeply problematic and has a lot of systemic oppression in it. And so Mm -hmm. even who Mm -hmm. is holding these religious leaders positions is deeply problematic in many ways. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, and then we're saying, oh, from that bunch that had a deeply problematic oppressive (laughs) um, route, why don't we pick our, and, and, and I'm like, ah, and I don't think that, especially in Christianity, which I said from my lens, we have really um, interrogated who can be religious leaders um, okay, well really enough for me to believe that I want to place that much trust in who we've chosen. One. Two. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want, so I, I know that doesn't even sound right, me wearing a collar, me saying this, but I'm, I, I've got nothing to lose. It's 2021. What are you going to do? Um, uh, and, and second of all, <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, if we ain't going to come truthful and fully and fully transparent and and that's part of my own faith journey like what is my role and how how do i move in this second i think what you said was beautiful let me say think if i'm saying your name right how do i pr- say it so i don't say it wrong is it mana manel yeah manel is that right perfect. say it again perfect. that is okay. it manel there okay. you go i didn't want to pronounce it um thank you um, so when you mentioned peace, I, I, peace is a trigger word for me. And I think, um, and, sh- and, and sh- she marked on that, remarked on that beautifully. I think in, in MLK's letter from a Birmingham jail, he tells the difference between negative peace and positive peace and positive peace being, I'm sure you know, like where justice thrives. And I also am very careful about how hegemony or people in power say we want peace. Mm-hmm. And to what that looks like for them. I've never, I, I don't think we ask the definition, the, the exploration of peace from the margins. We don't do that work from the least of these, from, mm-hmm. from the oppressed. And, mm-hmm. and even though Howard Thurman would say that we have a, a God of the oppressed um, and James Cone, and moving in that sort of the, liberation theology, th- that you almost need to come from there to get your, the, the, the sort of dynamic definition of what peace looks like and that peace is particular to a people and a place and a, and a positionality. So I, and I don't think when we use that word and I do think that word in and of itself has always been in my world, peace and reconciliation has always been from a white supremacist definition. And it always mm-hmm. meant a, 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 something to happen to black brown bodies in this country when peace and I, I and and by what measures we get peace is also you know and so hmm. I don't I basically what I said to the whole question I don't know <laughs> no, I don't no. know about religious leaders I don't know about the peace definition we're using right now and if we need to maybe explore that because I haven't heard a lot of definitions that felt like they were li- like they they were based in a deep liberation from the least of these from those of us at the deepest margins and until I hear that definition that's full of liberation and justice mm-hmm. and um, then I, I don't know what y'all are talking about and, and I'm not going to go ahead and describe and say I have a solution to something or I have a thought about something that I don't even know what's whirling around that word. All I know is that word for me has never meant truly peace. And so mm-hmm. I'm holding it in suspension until we can wrestle it out and we can know the particularities of it as it exists in bodies and places where it will look different. And I do wanna say this about religious leaders. Religious leaders, especially the ones leading, leading the forefront from Malcolm to Luther, Martin Luther, to Martin Luther King, they all switched midway through. They were like, uh, I don't know if this religious thing is working the way I thought it should, you know? And, and, and so you get religious leaders who are actually questioning the religious systems they're in or being rejected from the religious. But so I, I also want to give a fact that you get these socially, these socially minded, social justice minded ministers people, religious rooted people, especially Christians that I'm, I'm naming. And I don't think we give enough time to that, the transformation of what happens mm-hmm. to us on a religious journey that could take us wildly different and move us in a different faith journey and, and allow that to happen. So I guess to your question, I don't know. 
No, no, beautiful. I mean, that's, that's in of itself a, a, a response. And you see, it's not just me, Manel, asking crazy questions, but the responses yeah. I'm getting back yeah. to react to are as challenging as well, which is what it's supposed to be. No, thank you, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to first thank both of you for really sharing personal experiences, because when we talk about our faith journeys, myself also going, having gone through a long personal faith journey and working on conflict resolution, peace, when I mean peace, positive peace, that is one of liberation, of social justice, of freedom, of people living in dignity and in yeah. freedom. So that's what I mean by peace. Um, and I've seen the role of you know, religion playing a positive role, but also religion being weaponized, as Menel said, and being used as a negative force as well. But I just wanna first say thank you uh, for sharing both your experiences. And uh, one question that is really interesting, a comment, uh, Dr. Fatima, that you said that came to me is like, who gets to be called a religious leader? It's really reminded me that when I was at the Carter Center, we were doing this project that was inclusive approaches to preventing violent extremism. And so we were basically looking at Islamophobia and we were looking at the rise of uh, the right wing extremism, the rise of like Daesh, it was in 2016. And it was really interesting because to engage with women, <laughs> faith based leaders, we had to say faith based, you know, religious and community faith based leaders. Uh, so it's kind of this positioning or like who questioning the power structures yeah. and also how. Uh, you, the gatekeepers also uh, of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of who gets to be called what and who is in, um, but also the, the responses from you, Menel, and com comparing, it's the diversity also of experiences, right? Um, coming from an Islamic framework and then from a Christian background as well. And uh, the beauty of having this kind of conversation. I don't know, Menel, if you want to respond or if you have anything to add to what Dr. Fatima said. Oh. Absolutely. I mean, like just a lot of amens to what Dr. Batma said is for sure. Um, and, and something that landed almost like a ton of bricks was the idea that like, you know, not only did these religious leaders question their faith, their faith questioned them um, or their, their community. And I know that that's definitely something that as a peace builder, I've faced over and over. One is I don't belong to one community, right? There's tons of communities and sometimes different parts of my identity may be at odds, you know, particularly women and faith. Like there's a lot of moments of reconciliation between them. Um, but, you know, kind of going to the definition of words and something that, you know, I've said before, but never really internalized until I came into a faith space more and more, which was the power of words. And I tease my nieces. I'm like, there's a reason they're teaching you spelling. Like there's magic in every word. There's a spell behind every letter. And I think that that's where for peace, like I said, one of the hardest things was seeing how preventable the atrocities I saw was. Um, was seeing, you know, money being, you know, thrown at Iraq as the Central African Republic was struggling for basic aid. Like those type of decisions made it really, really clear to me over and over, this is not about peace. This is not about, you know, humanitarian. It's really clear what it is about. That said, it doesn't take away my power to create. And I think that's where, again, I wanna encourage more of us to come in the room because that definition of peace for, you know, a Palestinian who almost all the conflict resolution and conflict management and peace theories were written by the other side. So, you know, it, we're playing a game, we're playing a set of rules, we're playing, you know, a civilized language that was not written by us or for us. So we will always be at a disadvantage at the mediation table. And I think um, the way Oslo came in and took over Madrid was a real historical example of when actual peace was being negotiated, the entire European world flipped out, created Oslo and put us at a permanent disadvantage that we still have not recovered from. So of course, peace is, is, is a difficult word. I'll tell you another word I have a problem with, which is resilience. Um, <laughs> and, you know, something, you know, I'm resilient as hell and I'm, you know, power to my grandmothers and my ancestors for building, you know, and I really give them power because I'm, I want fragility. I'm like, how do we get to use that word? When do I get to be the fragile one where everyone cares about what I think, what I say, 
And of course, the answer to that is when you're in power. But, you know, I also resent the way people in war, people who are oppressed, the word being shoved down our throat is resilience, which we are and we're proud of, whereas the other side gets to be fragile. And, and again, I think of my ancestors bearing resilience and badge of honor, and I'm saying, no, no, I want the fragility card. I want to hide behind this for a while and see people tiptoe around us. Um, but all of that is created. And I think that's where... Um, I found my faith is in the journey of seeking, is in the journey of questioning. Um, and it's where I, you know, by no definition under Islamic law, can you call me a religion, you know, a faith leader? It just, it does not apply. And yet I own it because we are creators and it did not apply, you know, within the last 100 years, I would argue historically, we've had tons of women who were faith leaders in very prominent positions. But in the last hundred years, we lost that tradition. And so, I single-handedly decided to call myself a faith leader. And I mean, you know, being, <laughs> being inspired by faith, I was like, that is how I'm going to define faith leadership is yeah. I actually turn to faith as my social contract. I turn to faith as my moral compass. And I would never, ever force anyone else to, at the same time, it's just where I go. And I'd like us to start creating more. Let's create what peace means to us. Let's create what resilience plus our chance of being fragile would mean to us and what that looks like in a safe and protective space because that's the reality we can't afford fragility there's too much coming at us and then you know how do we start defining religious leaders that may be more of a collective um, and I don't know the answers either but I, I do know whenever personally or professionally we've left faith out of the room we've had to start over two or three years like just from ground zero because we did that. And so it's kind of almost a lesson learned and a thing that I discovered on my journey than it is something that I was born into or woke up to. In fact, I grew up in a very secular household which gave me a lot of freedom to choose faith. Thank you, thank you, Manel, and amen to that. Absolutely, we need to reclaim these words um, and it's up to us to uh, give them the definition that we want. Uh, Manel, it's a question, this is a question for you and you raised it actually on, you work tirelessly on uh, advocating for women's rights through a religious framework. And I'd like you to speak more about the role of women in religious peace building efforts. We know that religious leadership tends to be both patriarchal and hierarchical, meaning that women are often excluded from leadership positions. You just gave an example of how you are claiming it. I also gave an example of how we had to kind of to be able to, uh, you know, engage with different types of faith based leaders, the words that we had to use to be able to get them into the room. Um, so how can we ensure religious peace building does not exclude women, both in leadership roles and more broadly and concretely as a practitioner standpoint how can we ensure religious actors women religious actors participate so i think there are two fields one is the intra so what we're doing within yeah. religious space and i think that that's really important um and and i think that there has to be the term i use with the cross red lines is compassionate accountability because um, a lot of the, and, and I don't think it's just true of men, I see this within older generations as well, who don't necessarily want to let go, who push back on any new language and new movement. Um, one of the things I realized is their legacy, their legacy feels threatened. So if mm -hmm. you're able to tease out the positive from their legacy, if their leg legacy is all negative, then that it's, you just, you can't change it until you name it. Um, so we have an incident at a very popular mosque in Virginia where the imam is promoting um, FGM. You know, it's there's no way of sugarcoating it. He's promoting FGM. And, you know, all these people will try and give a different logic. And, and this is Northern Virginia, which is yeah, a yeah, huge yeah. educated population. Um, and so in those circumstances, you know, you got to name it, you got to change it. But in ones where it's just, you know, it's the old immigrant, you know, thing, or it's not as harmful, being able to acknowledge their legacy to let them go is one of the key elements I think is going to be important. Um, I think the other in terms of external is what we said about hugging to death, but also role modeling. Um, what I've noticed is like international delegations so let's say there's, you know, three female religious leaders who actually have a following. So especially when you look at southern Iraq, like the Sudras area, you had some powerful women who could create incredible change. 
Um, international community will meet like 10 religious women in one meeting, whereas they meet all the religious men one on one. Just that signaling alone tells you how they think of the religious women. So the role modeling and acknowledging, I think, is really important. And then finally, this is the argument I make with all governments and make with our own military is it's not nice to include women. It's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. um, they have the pulse of the community. They know they'll know foreign fighters in their streets faster than anyone else because they literally know everyone's child and who's playing with who. And, you know, there are just so many levels to where women really are the ones who generate abundance and generate like agriculture. I mean, 80 percent at one point, 80 percent of the world's farmers were women. Um, so it's not nice. It's absolutely necessary. And, you know, I get this a lot. As soon as we stabilize the country, as soon as, you know, things oh, are peaceful, okay. we'll talk about women. And my answer is always, you know, now I even just laugh in their face and be like, you're not going to stabilize the country. You're not until you talk to the women. Um, yeah. So it's not, no one's doing us a favor by addressing women's issue, particularly women of faith. If anything, we're the Rosetta Stone of peace. We're the one who has all the keys. Thank you, Menel. Absolutely. I always say it's not a woman's issue. Also, it's a human rights issue. It's like if you're trying to build the community and rebuild, right, um, you have to include half of the population that you just excluded if you want it to be sustainable, right? Because I hear it all the time. It's like, well, I think there are priorities right now. Let's just get the key parties on the table. And the women's issues is such a sensitive topic and a taboo. Let's keep it to the side. And I'm like, no, we're going to be back to square one and it's not like you're not doing a favor it's really a human rights issue thank you Menel, yeah. so much um dr fatima do you want to add anything to this um specifically on women the role of women in peace building in religious i think that was she said it beautifully i have nothing to add to that but my own complete <laughs> affirmation of that all that beauty right there and and truth being spoken thank you Dr. Fatima, this question is for you. Uh, beyond the prevention and resolution of violent conflict, or you know, conflict, it could be also community conflict, or we we spoke about racism, right, or oppression. Uh, religion can and has historically played a critical role in transitional and social justice movements. Today, we see religious actors in the United States using their voices to support Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, Dr. Fatima, you have worked tirelessly on racial and social justice uh, issues using a religious lens. I heard you speak, actually. This is what made me in one of your videos. And you really inspired me. You were talking about racial justice from a religious framework. I'd love for you to speak a little bit more about the role of religion in Black Lives Matter. And in so that's one question. And the latter part of the question is, and in what ways do you see a symbiotic effect like where religious institutions themselves, which may be and often are characterized by the same structural inequalities as societies at large are changed by these social justice movements such as Black Lives Matter? So I'm gonna say this, I think, so there's two things that I do. Um, one is that part of my work, I, and you caught me at a transition period in my life, as you can tell by my answers. Um, and I've taken the month of June off because I, I realized that I needed to figure out how I'm gonna, it's a saying of where and how I enter, that I needed to re-enter the work and probably needed to give myself number one, time to grieve, second, time to, to restore, come back to myself. And, and figure out what's next next in my path. And I say that because I think Black Lives Matter um, impacted, and part of my work is I teach at a um, Christian seminary, Luther seminary, and I teach a, a cohort of white clergy who are deeply impacted and wanna do something about race and how do, they, how do they begin dismantling racist theology in Christianity. So a good part of my work is like working in religious, Christian religion, and with clergy and congregations and how they dismantle the racism in it. Now, Black Lives Matter, I've, I've been astounded at how the movement has been beautiful and supported and it's, it's evoking now, remember that Martin Luther King also said that like 10 or 11 o'clock is the most segregated hour in America. I dare say it still is, as far as Christianity is concerned, where we go to church is still deeply segregated. Um, and then they call them some reconciling churches where they try to be multicultural. And I use the word try. And um, 
because most of the leadership ends up still looking white. Um, mm -hmm. So when you have black brown bodies in your congregation. So I say that because I think what Black Lives Matter movement has done is, is made, and it answers both of your questions, it's made the movement so pervasive and at the forefront of conversations that religions, that Christian denominations are actually wrestling with it, mm -hmm. if, if they had a tendency to it to begin with. Mm -hmm. And let me say this, I work with clergy who are trying to bring these issues to the pulpit and they're receiving huge backlash. So mm -hmm. part of my discussion last, last yesterday, what am I talking about last month? That's how you know this has been a long time. Yesterday with clergy, Presbyterian, Lutheran, um, Pentecost, it, and this group was like, what do we do when we're talking to a predominantly white congregation on Black Lives Matter and they are rejecting and rejecting the message and coming down on us and we're losing congregants on that. Mm. So, so, so then the question becomes mm. when we start speaking this and wanting the church to move in justice and social justice, and let me, let me be clear, white church, white Christian space that is predominantly yeah. white, Mm -hmm. it, and if they're they're catching on or wanting to do this work, there is almost a penalty attached mm. to doing this. So that that has been a hard discussion, right? And I think you get black churches and black Christian churches, and they've been talking about social justice as it links to a liberating God for centuries. So yep. this ain't this is not an un you know, mm -hmm. this is not a new dialogue. Black pastors moving, whether it be Reverend Barbara or whatever, they've been hanging out and doing this in the streets all the time. What is happening is that you're seeing that white denomination, white previously or very white denominate denominations, Christian denominations are now releasing books on how to do this work. How do we begin to tackle this work? And I want to say working with clergy white clergy in white congregational space who are doing this work and trying to move their congregations toward this are actually some of the most beautiful humans I know, but there is a backlash or there is a tension there mm. on why are you bring in the political to church. Mm. Very powerful. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I don't want to make it black mm -hmm. and white because I know that the whole sanctuary immigrant, how, how churches became sanctuaries, mm -hmm. that whole thing, that's that, you know, how we, they moved in that policy. So it's it's everywhere that you're seeing, but it particularly you asked me about Black Lives Matter. I also want to say this, and this may be unpopular too, but I, you know, I'm 46, I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, the civil rights movement was deeply rooted in a religious fervor. Black Lives Matter movement, which partly is led by black women, let, let, me, let me put that clear, black women and queer, some queer black women. So, mm -hmm. and sometimes the church has not always been the best, including black Christian church to queer our queer and trans LGBTQIA plus brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and family. And yep. so some of the Black Lives Matter movement was not moving alongside church predominantly because there was a sense in a way of which the church had rejected the bodies by which we're now moving in the Black Lives Movement, rightly so, right? So I heard Dr. Renita Weems, Reverend Dr. Renita Weems was like, we're passing a torch, but the church almost, the Black church almost has to get on board and, and be like, what are we doing? And how are we moving in Black trans life? Black trans life matters and how is that moving and that was the propulsion of black lives matter movement those were the bodies that were starting this discussion so the the church as a whole as far as christianity and what it's doing in american soil is actually coming to face some of its deepest prejudice mm -hmm. within the black lives matter movement whether they wanted to talk about it or not yeah and i want them to talk about it I'm like, Black church, what are you doing with our queer and trans brothers and sisters and family? I want to talk about white church. Why is it so hard for you to think that you, you're actually linked into this racism, that the Christianity, as Jennings, Dr. Willie Jennings would tell you, that Christianity and racism have been braided their from almost existence. Like, we can't do this work and unbraiding it? Or the diseased imagination around God? Like, so you get me preaching. Sorry, that's the Baptist in there. No, that's great. Absolutely. No, amen. Very powerful. And highlighting also the need for a really an intersectional approach that is very much needed 
but also, you know, by sharing your experiences and the struggles in your journey, the, 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 the challenge and the difficulties and the need for self-care, right? And, uh, yeah. and healing to be able to do this work and being able to pause and take a deep breath and say, okay, I need the time to, to be able to do this as well. I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. So before we continue the conversation, I wanna ask the audience if they have any questions, please uh, type any questions you have in the chat. We will be taking them. We have another 10 minutes before we conclude. And while we're waiting for some questions, I wanted to ask Manel if you had any kind of response or um, you wanna say anything to add to what Dr. Fatima said. I mean, of course I do, how can I not? There's so much that she said that is so powerful, but I think this is more of a testimony and a validation than, than a comment. Um, I mean, there's a reason I'm sitting in Baltimore right now. Uh, and you know, this last year or last year and a half with everything that's been going on was one of the most difficult. Um, I had a really bad death threat, all kinds of things that happened with peace activism, unfortunately. And when I really thought about who I would go to, um, I went to the African-American Muslim community, uh, which was like a second family to me. And you mentioned civil rights. And I think it's worth mentioning like that for me, I always say is the tip of the arrow. You know, all of us who came after were building on the waves of the original civil rights movement. And I think that's one of the things that also gives me hope is that we're finally, finally acknowledging and connecting. And what you described as the church, I think every religious institution, and I would say and hope every religious community is having to face to some one level or another, because whether we were active or came later, there's a complaint, complaint, complacency that comes with silence that I think everyone is now becoming more and more aware of. Um, there's an acknowledgement that as bad as our situation, I mean, I, was, I grew up with the, you know, Palestinian is the worst situation on earth. There's no other people who've been subjected as much as the Palestinians. And, you know, I went to, this is where my career was really helping. I remember coming back from Darfur and just being like, no, we don't get to complain anymore. We don't get to pretend like we're the worst. There unfortunately is so much oppression around the world. It's very easy to feel alone. It's very easy to feel like you are the forsaken that the books talk about. Hmm. Just in our unity and recognizing that we're together. I mean, I'm witnessing things I never thought I would witness in my lifetime. You know, I remember some colleagues from South Africa kept telling me we never thought apartheid would end. We only knew in the morning we had to keep trying. And that's where I was two years ago, was just kind of accepting status quo, uh, maybe low key hating on humanity. Uh, and then now two years later, I'm recognizing, no, we're actually just been in that deep slumber. Again, every book warns us about. We've been in this lack of consciousness. Um, and I, I see, I don't want to say we're out. We bought time is what I keep saying is we bought a little bit more time, but we can course correct. And I really, uh -huh. really believe in that. This conversation alone, listening to Dr. Fatima, the question she's raising, that tells me we are course correcting. It's just remembering we're not alone in the process of doing it. And, and that's, I don't know, I feel like I found another sister, Dr. Fatima, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about my Just Peace program. But yes. the more I have these connections, Huda, you and I have talked about Just in Peace for a while and about the role of religion. This is what fuels me. I don't believe in the systems. I don't know if I believe in the temples and the bricks and mortars of religion, but when I hear women like you, when I hear people of faith coming together, when and, and that's anything, that's not about God. Faith is just knowing there's something bigger than you. That's yeah. how I define it. Then I have hope. So thank you. You guys have really just injected me with so much hope today and I got a long day ahead. And I just <laughs> want to acknowledge and say thank you before the questions start rolling in. Thank you both. No, th thank you so much, Manel, for also, you know, connecting the struggles and, you know, the power of, of, of seeing the similarities and being able to work together um, and creating really these bonds of solidarity that are much, much needed and cross borders. I'm here in Morocco and look, I mean, there's so many similarities um, um, and these conversations inspire people across different geographical locations. So thank you both. I have one question coming in, which is, uh, what is the future of religious uh, peace building? How can it be more effective in the next decade?
Anyone want to? You wanna... can't go mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dream, my dream is the future of religious peace building as we move more towards the collective. You know, I think that, you know, we're, we're holding our breath, you know, waiting for another Malcolm, waiting for another MLK, waiting for another, um, you know, Gandhi, another, you know, religious leader that's going to come in. Uh, unfortunately, in the Arab world, we go as far as back as like Salah al -Din. Like we can't even think of anyone modern. Like we go far, far back in the history. Um, and, and I'm just so inspired by the youth movement. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, 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 I, and I come from a, you know, place where at 46 in meetings, people, when they say, let's hear the youth voice, they'll turn to me because they conflate women and youth. They think we're the same. <laughs> so I'm not talking about 40s youth. I'm talking about the really, really young. Um, I'm also equally concerned because if you watch or read what they're watching and reading, it's all doomsday. So the fact that they've taken on such a negative view of the world personally pains me because there's always hope. There's like, you know, we've been through all kinds of things and we know there's always hope. Um, but that's where I think the next, that's where I think the next um, leadership will come from is a collective. It's not going to be an individual. Um, I don't know what that will look like, but I'm definitely committed to creating what would a horizontal collective community leadership look like where we eliminate the need for hierarchy and have a different way of checks and balances and that's really what I'm looking towards creating because I don't think it exists but I know we can create it I like the positivity and confidence Manette <laughs> yes <laughs> Dr. Fatima I, I love it because I don't have it so, uh, so I'm like okay I'm just gonna go ahead and live off of you no, this is this is uh, great this is why this is yeah. great Share. Share. <laughs> yeah, we and share some of that. I think I'm moving in what Miguel de la Torre, um, Latinx theologian, would say was that we malign hopelessness. But in the life mm. of the Indian, hopelessness means that you've decided that what, and I've decided in my body, in my experience, that I've placed my hope in the sometimes in the wrong things. And that's where I've learned very starkly, and that I have to be more discerning about my hope. But Miguel de la Torre says that hopelessness sometimes drives the immigrant to find hope anew somewhere else. And you take the bravest mm -hmm. risk, you move yourself, you decide to do the bravest things because yeah. this place or this thing no longer holds hope. And that hopelessness actually is not as bad as you think. Anyway, beautiful. If you ever get to read his, like his lecture, oh. and his little sermon on that. And I want to say that my hope for peace building is that we reimagine. And I think what you're saying beautifully, I'm pointing to you, but it's, you, you, I don't know if we're all in the same <laughs> um, but, uh, but when she was talking about the um, religious peace building, I think the biggest thing for me is that with religious peace building, I hope the younger generation that she's mentioning is the reimagining. Is there's a reimagining happening, and that reimagining is divine. I want it to be deeply rooted in a divine, faithful move that sees humanity, and so. If I have to think about religious peace building, it is deeply right. rooted in a reimagination that I think the youth and when I'm raising Gen Zers, I absolutely love the questions they're raising. I absolutely like, well, mom, maybe if you start thinking about this and this and this, and some of the things I'm like, I'm actually appalled, but I'm like, oh, well, then maybe like, maybe people who are cruel are aliens, you know, you can't, they're not humans. <laughs> we're, we're trying to make them humans. I'm like, that's a good theory. <laughs> um, uh, so and, and I absolutely love, and when I speak to young people, that from the millennials who I, you know, who we always say as a generation, I absolutely adore, and these Gen Zers coming up, they are absolutely asking the right questions. And I, and, and I almost want to put into the universe the energy of the reimagining that is deeply liberating and that breaks the bounds and the confines of which we have placed what I think is a wild and untamed God. And <laughs> the fact that we have tamed that God is probably one of our biggest detriments. But I'm hoping this Gen Z is can, and, and these, even these young folks, they come with a reimagining around the divine that sets us free, that says, yeah. Maybe you've been reimagining who God loves and who how we do love all wrong. Maybe you've been yeah, setting yeah. up barriers that never needed to exist. And that is what I think religious peace building to me, it's a reimagining of what religion can be and how it sees the divine. That is a faith journey I'm willing to take over and over again, no matter how wild and untamed and risky it is. That's where I'm yeah. hoping. 
Beautiful, beautiful, Dr. Fatima. You, you're inspiring me. You know, it's I, I need to come to North Carolina to do it. <laughs> Let me know the next time I'm there. Um, thank you so much. Thank you both really for such an inspiring, uh, thought-provoking conversation that is honest, outside of the box, reimagining, collective. Really, it's been very, very powerful. Um, I'm sure our viewers are also very grateful for both of you to take time from your busy schedules to come and share with us your personal experiences, um, you know, your expertise. You've also shown from both different experiences how systems of oppression are not isolated from one another. In fact, they intersect in a number of significant ways. And I wanna conclude with Dr. King, he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And we are caught in an inescapable network of neutrality tied in a single garment of diversity. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I'm saying this from Casablanca, Morocco. Um, so thank you both again. Um, we all have a role to play to build an inclusive world uh, for us, for our children, for the next generation. Uh, where all can flourish and live in dignity and peace, regardless of race, religion, color, gender, or other social markers. So, so thank you again. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.